How are we all doing? Good, good. good. Uh, we are here tonight. This is the Apologetics Workshop. Uh, and it's exciting to be here, right? Yeah, yeah. into the word. I'm sorry. I'm kind of awkward. It's cool though. So we're just, you know, going to dive into the scriptures tonight, answer some some tough questions, um, but some necessary questions, right? So we can be equipped, um, you know, if these things come up in conversations or if we're out, um, you know, just spreading the gospel like we're supposed to be, like we're called to be. Um, a lot of times, uh, these are things that we might run into and things that might come up. Um, and so we need to equip ourselves, right? So we're not stumbling over our words and confused and, and, and not articulating the gospel and the truth that is in the Bible, right? Um, so I'll just start off with a prayer before we jump in. Um, and then we'll get into the introductions and everything. So if everyone could just, um, you can stand or you can, you know, just kind of bow your heads, pray with me. Um, God, we come before you tonight, Lord. I thank you for just giving us life on this day, God, just protecting us and providing for us uh, throughout the day and bringing us here tonight, giving us this opportunity um, to come together and to just dive into the scriptures, God, and to just be equipped, Father God. Um, and Lord, I pray that you speak through every person on this panel tonight, God, um, and that you just use them in a, in a powerful way and that this be a night of learning um, and that you just be glorified through it. And I pray that our hearts and our minds are open to receive your word, to receive your truth. Um, and I just pray that you have your way uh, tonight, God. I love you. And I thank you and I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, so we will start with introductions. Uh, before we get into that, so we're here tonight. We have the panel uh, discussion. Um, but tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m., we will have uh, three different lectures going on, um, and they're going to be amazing. I've been told, right, so I'm looking, looking forward to it. It sounds interesting, though, right? So the three topics are, um, who are the black Hebrew Israelites, and what do they teach? Um, what is the conscious community? And uh, talking about, like, its influence in the urban community. Um, and then we have a lecture on first century church history. Um, so some good, some good important stuff. Uh, so we'll be here at 10.30 a.m. tomorrow um, diving into those topics. Um, so if you're not doing anything on a Saturday morning, which I feel like most people aren't, uh, you know, just come on through and um, we'll spend a, a couple hours together uh, just kind of gaining some more knowledge. Um, so let's dive right in though. So I'll start with introductions. So starting uh, at the far end, we have Colin Bailey, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Colin. Uh, he's here from Bailey, Ohio, right? And he is an associate pastor at uh, Faith Life Church. So appreciate you being here tonight. Um, next to Colin, we have Desmond Ingram. Um, He's a minister here, um, so, you know, kind of put this together. So he's been he's been doing some really good work, um, putting putting these events together. Um, so Desmond, um, next to Desmond we have Michael Holloway. He is an elder at Power Hope and Grace Bible Church. Um, and now we have Chris Gillum, right? It's unclear on the paper. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Glad I got it. All right. uh, Chris is from Detroit. Uh, he is a minister at Strictly Biblical. All right. I like that. Strictly yeah. Biblical. Yeah. Give it up for him. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Andrew Hooper. Um, um, and he's a minister at Strictly Biblical, same, same strictly biblical as this. So these are our panelists. Um, so let's just one time just give it up for all the panelists. Right? <laughs> Sacrificing their time to be here tonight and to 
and to equip us, right, with this information and to do all the work, all the research, put in all the hours, right, to, to, to learn these things and to be able to articulate them. That's, that's tough stuff. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and we're just going to dive right into the questions. Um, so question number one. Actually, I lied. I just want to break down how tonight's going to work so you guys aren't. <laughs> so I'll stop talking in about like 15 more seconds. Um, so we're going to go through about six or seven questions. And then we're going to have a, about a 10 minute intermission. Um, and during that time, we'll have uh, some paper passed around. Uh, so if anyone has any questions they want to ask, uh, you can write it down. Um, and then we'll collect that, uh, those pieces of paper at the end of the intermission. Um, and then we'll spend uh, the last part of tonight um, kind of going through some of those questions. Does that sound, sound good for everybody? Yeah. 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 All right, in the bathrooms, uh, restrooms. So if you go down this hall, um, there's a door straight ahead. That's the kitchen, don't go in there. Um, but to the right is the bathroom right before the kitchen. And you can ask me again if you forget because I will be standing here sitting right there. Um, cool. So let's get right into it. So question number one, what is apologetics and why is it important? Right. Great question. Great question. Um, can everyone hear me? Uh, I don't think it's coming through. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I don't hear it through the speakers. That's all good. Let's see. Can you hear me good? Good? We good? All right. Great job. All right. So what is apologetics? Uh, so we get it from the Greek word apologia, right? It just means to give a defense, uh, give a defense of one's opinion. Now, our opinion is actually true. You know, Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Um, he's only salvation. Uh, Christianity is true. Um, you know, salvation, once again, is only through Christ Jesus. Uh, the Bible is the word of God. So those are the truths that we hold on to. But we have to give a defense for that. Why? Because unfortunately, we do see many cults, um, and especially in the inner city, dealing with identity cults. You go even further, we got the Mormons, you got Jehovah's Witnesses, you got, uh, you know, even Muslims, right, who attack the Bible, they attack Christianity, they attack the deity of Christ. So we always have to give a defense of what we believe. Um, we're all called to be apologists, in a sense. Now, uh, we're not called, we may not be called to be Rabbi Zacharias, right, um, and others, but we are all, all called to give a defense for what we believe. Um, so, so, yeah. yeah. All right, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise uh, I'm grateful to be here. Thank God for Pastor Rob and his family, and we just thank God for Minister Desmond for the invitation. But uh, just to jump right in, apologetics is, and, and Minister Desmond basically uh, said all that I could say, but I, I kind of wrote something down here. Uh, the art of explaining the faith in such a way as to make a reasoned defense against its detractors. And so you all know that Christianity is, because it's the truth, is going to have detractors. And so we need to have a reason explanation you know sometimes when people consider christianity they think it's you know we just believe all of this because of what they would call faith in other words you you don't have proof but truly christianity is the only truth built on facts and so in order to understand what Christianity is, you've got to learn the facts of Christianity. We're not just saying, I'm going to heaven, which well, just because. No, we, we know the facts. Uh, we've got eyewitness testimonies, and we've got letters, and we've got things like that, and we can get into later. But apologetics, we have to put that reason defense. And what one example we have in Scripture comes from Acts chapter 17, where Paul's uh, sermon at Areopagus you all know that when he saw the uh, unto the unknown God that was there on Mars Hill, and Paul made one of the most powerful. That would be to me uh, a good place to start if you want to study apologetics. Read the Apostle Paul and, and particularly that sermon that he preached on Mars Hill and how he was able to take what they did and make it applicable and he preached a gospel message so that's really what apologetics is learning the facts and being able to deliver those facts in, in a comprehensible way where people can receive it and be delivered yeah. mm -hmm. um, also to add uh, and again thanks for having me here as well um, to add to that um, Paul um, started where the people were all right, so you can't just, just bring them into church and just, well, come on over uh, on, on Friday night and we'll come to the revival. No, you, you have to start where there are, you know, if they see you on the street, you're in the barbershop, you're in the hair shop, you're wherever, start where they are. Where are they coming from? At that stage, and, and, and you can get to the cross, but you got to start there. 
You always have to go to the marketplace and start in the marketplace where they are, wherever they might be, whether it's, and that's following Christ's playbook, play by play. Yo. Okay. <laughs> All right. So last one. So thank you, uh, Pastor Rob, for having us here. And uh, I just want to put a couple of scriptures behind this, mm -hmm. so that you know, saying it's on the tape for the people who ever may watch. Uh, first, uh, I would like to go to Jude three and four, mm -hmm. because as the brothers have uh, already said, it is very important for us to contend for the faith. So. Here it is, Jude 3 and 4. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Why? For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our Lord God into lewdness and deny the only God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So as we see, it is a command that we do this. And I think it's very important that people know what scriptures to go to. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, Titus 1.13. And it says this. Can we find it? Um, it says, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Right? So these are commands from God. These are things that was uh, given to Paul and other writers from Jesus Christ that we do. So it's important that we all get out and do this. Another thing I like to say, right? You got your fivefold ministry. So you got your apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors, right? Well, everybody in here is accountable to be in one of those, right? Fivefold ministry. So it's definitely important that we all contend for the faith, right? Amen. Amen. Figure out chime in finally. Um, for me, I look at the fact that a lot of people are. A lot of people who claim to be believers are against, you know, the art of apologetics. Like you shouldn't be arguing with people. But like the brothers already explained, you know, it's, it's to communicate to people where they are so that they understand uh, our faith. And Jesus himself engaged in apologetics. I think about when he engaged the woman at the well. That's definitely an apologetic work, meeting the people where they are. And he was able to influence her to where she went back and told other people about her. And that's the job. Amen? Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, great answers. So, yeah, I think that was... Uh, so what I want to do right now, because I think, like, questions may come up um, while um, you are speaking. Uh, so, Chris, if you can, like, just pass out some paper now there's pens like a million of them over there um yeah so chris is going to pass out some pens and paper uh just in case any questions or anything kind of comes up uh comes to mind i don't want you to forget um waiting for the intermission um, or if you just have any questions that don't have to do with anything that we talk about uh let me write that down too um so while chris is doing that we'll go ahead and move on to the second question Right. So, so speaking of Jesus, right, our Lord and Savior. Um, so, if Jesus is God, why did He say the Father was greater than Him? I guess I'm getting thrown to the wolves here, right? <laughs> why did Jesus say the Father is greater than I? And um. This is going to go to, like, um, when we start talking about hermeneutics and exegesis and all that kind of stuff, fancy word is, what are they saying in the book, okay? Uh, so if we're trying to figure out what they're saying in the book, um, how many people would read, if you're going to read a newspaper article, how many would start at the middle of a sentence? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. You wouldn't do that, would you? Right? It doesn't make a lot of sense. So in order to understand what is being said in the scripture, we can't just pull out verses by themselves. It's called proof texting. Very bad, bad way to do, do things. All right? Um, and we will have to look at what the whole conversation was about. And most of us have Bibles that have red letters. Right? Um, so I'm going to invite you all to turn to uh, John chapter 14, if you got it. 
All right, and y'all should be out here with your swords, amen? amen. All right. <laughs> so uh, John chapter 14 um, and verse 28 uh, is where you get that, um, that uh, thing. And I'm not here to preach, by the way. So. Preach. Preach. Hey, don't, don't, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Wait too many Give a preacher a microphone. I'll be here all night. Right? It's God said. <laughs> so verse 14. I'm reading from NASB. I hope that doesn't bother anybody or offend anybody. But um, NASB says, you have heard. Jesus is talking. You heard that I said unto you, I go away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now, if you have red letters, right, you can look above and below. It's still red letters, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's in the middle of a conversation. So we would not go and just grab that and piece that together and see, like, say, Jesus ain't God. So if I would invite you guys to scoop back up to uh, verse same chapter and verse uh, 11. We'll start from verse 11 right here. Um... All right, it says, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. Now, we can stop there and ask the question, how many disciples did greater works than what Jesus did? Greater, you have to define your terms. Are we talking about greater as in greater authority, greater as in greater number, greater than all these kinds of things? So if we're looking at this, we know that Jesus walked on water and he healed the sick, raised the dead, all this kind of stuff. All the, the apostles, we follow the apostles through um, the book of Acts, we'll see that they did all these things. But there's more than one. And they went out into all the world and spread the gospel and doing these things. So it's greater worse than that. I'll also invite you to go back to John chapter uh, 5, right? Because the question is really the authority of Christ, right? How, who does Jesus think he is? Okay? So <laughs> um, just give me a few minutes here. John chapter 5, and we're going to go down to verse 21 real quick. All right? Um, he says, uh, well, you got it, if you're writing it down, uh, John chapter 5 and verse 21, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so, pregnant pause, even so, the Son gives life to whom he wishes, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son so that they will all will honor the Son, watch this, even as they honor the Father. How do you honor the Father? Do we pray? Do we worship? Do we give God, do we give Him glory? Yeah. Right? That's all the things that we would do to Christ. And why in the world would we do that? Go to John chapter 1. Because in the beginning, come on Bible scholars, was the Word, and the Word was, and the Word was, come on here. Good job, Pat. I, I like what you're doing in here. You got a bunch of Bible scholars, right? So we have these, these, if we read the book and look in the book, the whole book of John is high Christology. What's Christology? The study of Christ. Who is this guy? It's high Christology. And make no mistake, John is telling you exactly who he thinks Jesus is. Just to add to what he said, um, going back um, to John 14, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in context, I can start at verse 25. He says, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I have said. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let neither let it be afraid then he says you heard me say to you I am going away and coming back to you if you love me you will rejoice because I said I am going to the father the father is greater than I so in context you can clearly see this is when we get into the the, the doctrine of um, the incarnation and we start talking about Christ you know laying aside his glory and his deity um, the, the not, not laying aside the deity, but laying aside the, the access to right. and, and submitting himself to the Father. Mm -hmm. Right? So when we talk about the incarnation, he's now submitting himself to God and he's becoming as man would operate. 
<laughs> so, so that's what he means by the Father is greater than I. So he, he's not talking in a sense of him being God and the Father being greater than him still. He's talking as a man. But, but watch, he says, I go to the Father, therefore he will send the helper in my name. Therefore, he's now saying, and, and we can go back to John 17 where he says, and now, Father, glorify me back together with you, yeah, with good. the glory that I had before the world was. Right. So, so we're, we're talking about him and his incarnation. We're not talking about him being lesser, a lesser God than the Father right. at all. Come on. Amen. Come on, Just to add real quickly, uh, and dear brother brought it out very, very well, uh, Christ willfully submitted to the Father. It was volitional will. And Philippians chapter number 2 kind yes, of brings that right out. Yes, sir. We can, I'll just start at verse 5. Yes, sir. Let this mind be in you, mm -hmm. which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Other translations would say he did not consider it uh, a thing to be grasped, to, to have equality with God. So if he's equal with God, he's equal with God. But, verse 7, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in likeness of men. So, so as our dear brother just stated, he willfully submitted. And, and he goes on to talk about how he humbled himself. Some translations say emptied himself. I don't necessarily like that word, but I think what it is is Christ, at his own prerogative, chose not to uh, access his divine qualities because he never ceased from being God. Amen. He's God all the time, right? He's God right now, but but he he did not choose to uh, access his divine. Uh, nature and his divine qualities and he humbled himself and became a man which is which is powerful for us and last point on this that that text where it says the father is greater than I what it does tell us uh, which is a different question but it answers it is there is a distinction between the father and the son all right we can go home that's an important question though that's crucial yeah, to question. the gospel right like if you don't understand this like i don't even think you fully grasp the gospel right so it's crucial to be able to articulate that mm -hmm. i think you all did amazing um so let's go to the third question. Um, how do you get involved in apologetics? I would say, um, I would say uh, the way to get involved with apologetics, you know, definitely you find someone who's doing apologetics, right? Um, a lot of times, and, I, and I'll be honest, I think especially here in Detroit, in the metro Detroit area, I think we can all agree that it's kind of scarce to find mm -hmm. people who engage in apologetics. You know, a lot of people don't even know what apologetics is. A lot of people think apologetics is apologizing to somebody. Right. You know, right. I remember we did a, a Christ conference at my brother's AJ's church and dealing with apologetics. And some people were like, man, you know, not at his church, but you know, while we're like, man, why do we need apologetics? We don't need to defend the faith. You know, the Holy Spirit is enough. Like, yeah, we know the Holy Spirit is enough. But you know, the Holy Spirit is still guiding us to uh, learn apologetics. Um, but I would say definitely get with people who engage in apologetics. But also, um, like a lot of these books that I have, um, <laughs> these books up here, um, you know, find books. You know, find books. Find primary sources. Find things that uh, will uh, counter uh, these uh, the opposition that people are giving you uh, because and I'll deal with it tomorrow, pseudo-scholarship. You know, a lot of pseudo-scholarship meaning false scholarship. People talking about, you know, Jesus, and we'll talk about that uh, later. Jesus is really Horus. Where are you getting that from? But if we got the primary sources, if we have the, the right books, if we have access to it, then we can counter that, those arguments. So I would say get around some people who know it, um, but also invest in your library. Yes. We invest in shoes, clothes, mm. Taco Bell. We do all that. <laughs> we do all that. But we rarely invest in our study time, mm -hmm. and that's a problem. But get around some people who do apologetics. Also, buy some resources. Um, yeah, the question, um, the, the, the world is changing. I think we can all agree about that, right? Um, I'm, I'm just turned 41 this summer. Um, and uh, I got the baby for you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Dad, by the way. 
Uh, shout out to my dad and my sister back there, and thank you for, they came all the way from Toronto, so. Love, uh, uh, um, But yeah, uh, we can all agree that the world is changing. It's not the same thing, because back in the day, you could say, I know that I know that I know, right? I, I feel it, you know? And that's good enough, right? And you just had to, or you, you brought your kids to church, and there was no other, uh, it was weird to, to not believe in God. Yeah. Right yeah. now, it's weird to believe in God. Come on, yeah, true. Yeah. I got I got kids at home. They're eight and uh, almost. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, eight, almost nine years old and ten. And the world is different. They got um, and I'm not trying to uh, pick on low hanging fruit, but in middle school they have you know like transgender kids in middle school. You know, in middle school, I was trying to still, you know, think it was cool to watch G.I. Joe or not. You know what I'm saying? Now they, the, the world has changed, yeah, man. Yeah. And, like, people are asking questions that have never been asked to regular saints before. Mm -hmm. All right? And then now that you have other people that um, are, 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 are theologians, or so they say, pastors, and things of that nature. I'm going to bang on pastors a little bit because I'm a pastor too, right? So um, there are many pastors that are out here that do not know what they're talking about. Okay? We, and we in the city of Detroit, right? And I don't know if anyone's listening or they're going to be offended if they watch this, but we know that there's a large studio not far from here, right? And they'll, you, you put it on at any time of day, somebody's going to be talking about portals and seeds and this and the visions and all this stuff, and you can't find none of it in the book. You understand what I'm saying? And so when we have, when people are getting fed that week after week, month after month, and being told all this stuff, Right? And then they go into the, the streets and they're finding out that all this stuff that I did, I sold my thousand dollars. Come on, man. Okay? I did all that and I'm telling you from my experience. I didn't tell us that a thousand, but I took some rent money and just, I'm going to leave. I got got. You know what I mean? And a lot of people, right, will have, have gone through these things and, and they lose faith in Christ yeah, yeah. because they've been lied to from the pulpit. Can we, can we be real for a minute? All right? And so one of these things is you have to be able to recognize what's in the book and say to God and people that are listening, don't expect to be fed. Learn to feed yourself. Amen. Pastors need to learn and we need to teach our, our, our church members how to study the scriptures for themselves accurately. That's right. And if we don't know what we're doing, how in the world are we going to teach anybody else how to do it? You know, and so that's one of those things that we have to be able to give an answer for what we believe in, how to study the Bible, all these kinds of things, man. And so that's kind of passionate for me uh, as well, too. So I don't take that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really quick, um, Desmond talked about resources. What are so? What would you suggest, like? What are a couple, like maybe two or three resources, like somebody should kind of just start off with? Um, I think that book right there, the blue one, big blue one, right there. Systematic, uh, yeah. systematic theology, by the way, is there. Uh, that's definitely a start. <laughs> that one right there, the new evidence uh, by Josh McDowell, that's new evidence that advances the verdict that has pretty much everything in there. Um, a third book, man, oh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> the Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. You know, it was said that Jesus wasn't real. Um, no, he gives you the evidence that you know, Christ was real. He's a historical figure. He's not some myth. He's not a fairy tale. No, there was a man named Jesus um, who walked the earth, who was crucified. Um, so those are the three I would say you could definitely start. But, yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Also, uh, I don't know if this one's going to back. Also, uh, to do your word studies, get a good concordance, yes. right? all your word studies, get some good dictionaries and just get around people that's really studying so they can show you how you know what I'm saying, to go through the scriptures and, and scrub them, study to show thyself approved. So make sure you do that. If I can interject just real quick. Oh yeah. The Bible. Thank you. Man. <laughs> Textbook. What I found out is, the, is the, the best, and all these, don't get me wrong, I, I Got a lot of these. I, I might take this, but, <laughs> but so all resources are great. But there is no better book than the Bible. Amen. I mean, spend time. People want to learn the Bible, and they say, uh, you know, 
Instead of actually spending time reading the Bible, they're reading about the Bible. Mm -hmm. right? Read right. the Bible. And I'm going to tell you, and then when you get these books, it'll click more yes, because right. you've already familiarized yourself with the text. Amen. Amen. And one more thing, if I may. Um, so this is Des's Bible right here, right? Um, thank you. So um, in the Bible right here, right, you see little things in the margins, right? This is a study Bible, right? And so it has some footnotes at the bottom, right? Um, they're there for a reason, right? They're, they're there for a reason. There's a lot of um, cross references, right? Thank you, sir. Uh, there's lots of cross references in Scripture uh, where one person is talking about something else, or maybe Jesus or one of the apostles quotes the Old Testament, and it's very wise to go back and look at what they was talking about. Yes. All right, and before you know it, I'm telling you, you do that for a little bit at a time, and all of a sudden you'll find yourself, you'll be in the Word for uh, minutes upon minutes, hours upon hours, and it's going to get, get exciting again for you. You know, one of my former pastors used to say this all the time. He used to say, things are not hidden in the Bible from you. They're hidden in the Bible for you. Right. Dig it out. Go look. Wrestle with it. Fight with it. Go back at it for more. I don't understand. Good, keep reading. You know? Um, and all of a sudden, after a while, things start to get clear for you. And then you have good resources like pastors that you can trust. You know, Pastor Rob, God bless you again. Um, and these ones uh, that are here um, that know what they're talking about, they, they'll encourage you to get in the book. And all of a sudden, things begin to get real for you. And it's not just, I sat here, I sat here for a good time, and I really didn't know what happened. That's right. You know? Get in the book and be familiar with your, with your sword. Amen. Awesome. My, oh my goodness. Um, so moving right along, question number four. Uh, how do we determine what the essentials of the Christian faith are? Okay. All right. So, and I'll, I'll, I have to ask this question. I think the whole Bible is essential. Now, if we're asking what's essential for salvation or what's essential? So here's my view on it. How do we determine what are the essentials of Christian of the Christian faith? For me, it's by the doctrine. If you'll turn with me, 2 Timothy 3 and 10. And it says this. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, and perseverance. So if we continuously follow the doctrine, then we'll know all the essentials, right? Also. Romans 6 and 17. Which reads, But God, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Right? So if we continuously follow the doctrine, and for me, like I said, Everything in the Bible is essential. Mm -hmm. I, know, I, know, I know some people say, well, this is essential, that is essential. But for me, the whole word is essential. Mm -hmm. Here's another reason. Uh, Romans 15 and 4. That's what I want. And it reads as this. For whatever things were written before were written for your learning, that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, you might have hope. Mm -hmm. Right? So... You read the scriptures, you get on the doctrine. For me, all of it is essential. That's right. I, I definitely agree. It's, it's, it's a matter of how you approach the question. What, what are you looking for? Are you talking about essentials for salvation or essentials to be orthodox? Because in order to be orthodox, you, you have to cling to what Brother Andrew said. You have to cling to all of the scriptures. Like the, the, all of the teachings, like the virgin birth, uh, the deity Christ, the the um, resurrection, all, all of those things are essential. Like every every doctrine in the Bible is essential when it comes to that. But personally, I think that when you talk about essentials for salvation, I think that that's a little different. I think what that does is there there are things that you can be wrong about and still you know make it in. I, I do believe that there are things that you absolutely cannot be wrong about, though. <laughs> one of those things, I would say, is the deity of Christ. And I say that because he said it. Right? 
He said that. He said that if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. You won't be saved. Uh, another one. Uh, I believe that it's absolutely essential to um, be dedicated to Christ or to to acknowledge Christ before men, because He said it. He said that if you don't acknowledge me before men, then I won't acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Um, I think I have one more that I feel like was essential. Oh, the gospel. The gospel is absolutely essential. <laughs> right? Because once again, and, and it was so important that, you know, God says that it's his power to salvation. And so much so that the apostle said that if, if anybody preaches any other gospel, Ooh, yes, sir. let him be accursed. Come on now. Right? So I believe that those things are essential. And then you start talking about uh, essential things that you must do. You must repent. Oh. You know, you must you must believe that Jesus is the only way. Like you must you must forgive. Like you must you must love. And those are things that are commanded in Scripture. Otherwise, like you you won't be forgiven. Like he he won't receive you. Amen. Yeah. And I think too we have to be careful to make our uh, non-essential issues essential issues. True. What I mean, uh, like eschatology, right? We I I, I think we can. Throw down the line. Some probably pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I don't even know no more. <laughs> I like I like what Pastor uh, Ken had told me one time. He said, uh, "I'm pan trip." I'm like, "What that mean? I'm, I'm panning it out. I'm just letting everything." <laughs> <laughs> you know, so if <laughs> so, so yes, if it's the, we have to agree that it's in Christ. Um, salvation alone is through Christ. Faith alone, right? Uh, the death, burial, resurrection. Hell is real. Okay. Mm. Uh, heaven is real. This is in our mindset. It's not. No, we have to agree on those type of things. Even this. Be careful. Those people who begin to question the epistles. Yeah. Black Hebrews or white. Uh, you know, a lot of them will say, "Oh, you can't trust Paul." You know, because he right. little sketchy. No, 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 no. no. You, you mean to tell me the same Christ that appeared to Paul right. is a little sketchy now? Mm. Right. No, no, no. Be careful of those people. Yeah. Just to real quickly, you know, I would say. The physical coming of Christ, like we we must believe, because there are a lot of Gnostic, mm -hmm. uh, over spiritualized type doctrines out that will say Jesus came, but he wasn't really flesh and blood. That mm. that's heresy. Jesus physically came. He was born of a virgin. Another essential, yeah. right? Joseph was not his father. I've talked to people who believe that Joseph and Mary uh, <laughs> had committed fornication before this official ceremony. And here comes Jesus, born out of wedlock. And they took a scripture out of context where the Pharisees told Jesus, you be born of fornication. Right, right, and, right. and they just totally, uh, totally tortured that passage. But, but no, so the <laughs> physical coming of Christ, and that's important, uh, last point on it, that's so important that his physical coming, he died physically, yeah. he rose physically, yeah, yeah, he's coming back physically, yeah, yeah. and our hope is that we also now then will have a physical bodily resurrection. Amen. 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 Awesome, awesome. Um, so we're going we're gonna to keep it on Jesus uh, for a little while longer. Um, question number five. Is Jesus a proper transliteration of his name? <laughs> and what are the implications of getting the name wrong? <laughs> so, you have, uh, among things I can pull up uh, right away, you have Yahawashai, you have Yeshua, you have Yahashua, you have, um, oh, okay, thank you. You have, um, what else am I missing? A uh, whole bunch of Yehoshua. Yeah. Yehoshua. Yehoshua, yes, there's a Yehoshua, and there's all kinds of things. Um, and that uh, comes temp uh, primarily from uh, sacred namers, right? Um, and, you know, you get uh, scriptures like, you know, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, uh, and so forth. You have, um, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, anything that you ask in my name, I will do. You know, uh, things like that. And so we get kind of caught up um, in uh, in the word name, and then the word name. And the problem is that we're not thinking in the authority. Yeah. We're not thinking about terms of authority. Stop in the name of the law. Stop in the name. Of the law. <laughs> right? Yeah. What's love's name? 
That wasn't a question that Diana Ross and the Supremes were saying. That's what Diana Ross, okay? So, I'm in Motown, I should know that. <laughs> right? Um, it's more of Jesus is talking about his authority. And if you notice, uh, in the scriptures, again, if you take a, a good close look, they're all the um, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, uh, the scribes are always the bad guys, right? They're always questioning by whose authority yeah. are you doing this stuff? That's the same question that they asked the apostles in Acts, uh, I want to say it's mm, maybe 12, something like that, by whose name? No, three. Think it up, uh, uh, three, right? Three, four. Yeah, right, three, four, right? Uh, by whose name are you healing these people? Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk, right? And so it's not by Yeshua, Yahweh Shai, anything like that. It's by the authority of Jesus. Again, we're going back to the deity of Jesus. If Jesus is not God, in Matthew 9, he was guilty of blasphemy for saying, son, your sins are forgiven. Oh, my God. Right? <laughs> so we have some issues here if we're not if we're not recognizing it. So we're it's it's a it's a misnomer of the, the, the term name as if it is my name is Colin C O L I N. But if someone's write, writes me a check and it says C O L L I N, I'm going to catch it. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> right? And and watch this. The intention, C O L L I N, was for me. Y'all catch that? The intention was to be given to me. And the funny thing is, they'll say that God is uh, omnipresent, he's omniscient, he knows everything. So why in the world, if you call him Yahuwah or Yehoah or Jehovah, all of a sudden he don't know who you're talking to? Mm -hmm. That's what we do in school, right? My, uh, my name is uh, L L Lakanda. Not Laquanda, I don't know who you're talking to, right? And we apply that foolishness, right, to the scriptures. Do we not? Right? And so, um, I don't know, um, uh, let me see, I want to try and see if y'all can see this. Um, can you zoom in on this uh, screen right here? So this is how the name uh, Jesus is translated, right? Uh, from Yeshua or something like that, Josh or something like that, Joshua, Yeshua, right? And then so it goes from going from uh, Israel, um, Hebrew, excuse me, to Greek and so forth. And you follow it down, right? There's no shin, right? And so uh, the letter shin will be like that sh sound, right? And in, in, uh, in Hebrew, if I'm correct. Um, and then going further, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to understand. Y'all can see that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So there's no sh sound in uh, Greek, right? Um, and so Yesu, right? Um, and it goes from Yesu. And when we're talking about uh, translating from one language to the next, it's Yesus to indicate that it's a male. Right? Um, we have a primarily Hispanic church here, right? So you have um, uh, like a name like, uh, oh, Tio, Tia, right? Yep. And uncle, yep. right? So male and a female relative, right? So uh, you'd have things like that. So Jesus, and then we have Jesus, right? That comes from with the, uh, the last S is drop here, and you get Jesus, hmm. right? If you look at, um, anyone familiar with the Septuagint? Absolutely. Okay, so the Septuagint is the Greek Old Testament. Right? And if you look at um, what the Septuagint is in Greek, right, for the book of Joshua, you're going to see Jesus. Okay? So it's not like you're using a different name to indicate a different person. Okay? I speak English in 2019. I don't speak first century Hebrew or Aramaic. But I'm referring to the same person. Because I know, at the name of Jesus, what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Come on, and I know y'all can say, when you prayed in the name of Jesus, Amen. something happened for y'all. Mm -hmm. So, unless we're all wrong in here, and I don't think we are, right? We're in good, pretty good shape, all right? Go ahead, brother. Yeah. I was just going to say uh, one thing, too. Um, I was in a debate with a, a gentleman. He was a Hebrew Israelite. Real respectful, but his argument was that you can't use the name Jesus because the uh, translation is different. But the issue that we run into, he was saying that Jesus and Yeshua were two different people. And I'm like, that is that is a historical fallacy. Like, no scholar will take you serious if you say that. Like, if we take King David's name in English, it's David. But then we look at the, the, the Hebrew for it. it it's, yeah, it's translated different, right? 
But we're not going to say, oh, those are two different people. Right. If I even took, um, C uh, what was it, uh, uh, Caesar, right? Mm -hmm. And I spell it out in the English, it's going to be different if I spell it in the Latin, right? right? right. But we're not going to say those are two different people. Right. Right. That is a historical fallacy, and you should not be teaching if you believe that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you are nailed it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's. Uh, we have a couple more questions before our intermission. Um, I think we're making making good time too. You guys are precise. Amen. Hitting hard. I like it. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Um, why are identity codes on the rise in urban communities? I'll take it real quick. Um, it's a big problem, man. Um, I think as Colin touched on, I'm actually going to uh, touch on it tomorrow, too, when deal with the conscious community at the lectures. The prosperity gospel was really a precursor to a lot of this stuff, man. When you go to a church, they talk about naming and claim it. You go get your breakthrough if you sow the seed, and you get people in the inner city. They go home and they, they're not seeing this break. They're seeing these false promises. So what happens is they leave the church angry, but I still believe that they have a, a, a void of still wanting to be taught something, right? They still believe that there is a deity out there, that there is a God out there, but they want to be taught. So as soon as you leave the doors of a prosperity church, guess who's there? The conscious community is there. The, the, the black Hebrew Israelites, they're there. And guess what? Now they begin to teach them something because the void is still there because they want to be taught. Guess what? When Bible studies are not um, heavy, when you're not really dealing with the scripts, guess what? There's a void there. Yeah. There's always going to be somebody out in the streets to like, hey, brother, come on, man. They ain't teaching you, they ain't teaching you heavy in the church. Right. They ain't teaching you about the true church history. They're not teaching you about uh, what Jesus really did. They're not teaching you about all these other things. So when we begin to even ignore uh, primary issues when dealing with the scriptures, when we're not really taking a study of the uh, scripture series, there's always going to be somebody waiting on the outside. Those wolves are always going to be on the outside. So that's why I believe the, the best protection that we have is teaching the scriptures amongst each other. Amen. Amen. Because when there's no teaching, man, there's wolves out there waiting Amen. to steal people from the church. Yeah. Amen. And a lot of times, you know, we have to put onus on ourselves in the church. Right. Because we're like, well, that person really wasn't saved. No, we wasn't teaching. <laughs> they wanted to get saved. They wanted to learn the scriptures, but we didn't teach them. We do a lot of things. We, if like, like tonight, let's be honest. If we said it's going to be a prophetic conference, oh, and everybody going to be this one, everybody, they, we, we taking the offering and everything. You know, we say it's going to be a worship night. Everybody in this boy, let's be honest. It's nothing wrong with worship, but. It's those things that are outside the scriptures of studying the word that gets our attention. And unfortunately, they see that. The conscious community, the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, they see that. So what do they do? Come on over here. We're going to teach you the real thing. And they take care of their people as well, right? Out, even outside of the things of the church. So I believe those are the reasons why we see uh, identity cults on the rise. And just cults in general. Well, I'm talking a lot tonight. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, I'm going to get a little um, uh, real uh, as well, too, and it might make a little be couple folks uncomfortable, so bear with me. But if we're going to be honest, let's be honest. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, I'm sitting close to the door, so if you don't throw stones, <laughs> give me some warning. <laughs> All right? Um, no, but I, I, in honesty, right, um, a lot of people, and we're going to talk about it tomorrow, um, about a lot of folks believe, um, especially camp Hebrews, believe that uh, blacks are cursed by God, right? They were cursed, the, 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 the curse of Deuteronomy is, who else does it fit? That's what they say, right? Um, and let's just be honest, if we're gonna be from what has happened between the transatlantic slave trade, um, slavery, Jim Crow, all that fun stuff, um, black folks have had a really rough time in this side of the world, you know? Um, and if we're gonna be honest, a lot of people um, can't help but answer the question of, I believe in God, I believe God is good, but why is my life so jacked up right now? Why is it that we can look in the street and I see people like me getting shot up daily? I can look in the street and I can see people, um, um, and I'm not going to get political, but you know what's going on, you know who's in my house and how people feel about it. 
right? Um, why is this going on? Why is that going on? I live, um, y'all remember John Crawford III, the guy who got shot at Walmart, right? I live, uh, I live less than 15 miles from that Walmart. I, my wife and I used to date and walk around that Walmart. Okay? Trayvon Martin, or not Trayvon, but um, uh, Tamir Rice got killed not very far from here between me and y'all. Right? And so when things like that happen, say her name, hashtag, right? All these things are happening and people are trying to make sense of it. Yeah. And here's the question that I need people to understand. If people are going to say the best explanation for my existence as I know it is that I'm cursed, we got big problems in this country. And as a church, we must deal with it. We have to. Because if we kind of keep skirting around the issues and things of that nature, does white supremacy exist? Yes, no, maybe so, I don't know. Then guess what? The wolves are saying, yeah, do, and you know it. If they're not going to tell you in there, we'll tell you in here. Uh-oh. Okay? I don't mean to get all serious and, and uncomfortable and, and eggshells and stuff like that, but we must be honest with what's going on and what's happening in our world right here. All right? And so that's why that's an underlying issue for some people. We're going to touch on some, a lot of that tomorrow uh, between the, a couple of the lectures. And so, you know, stay tuned, man. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be all right, but that's, that's one of the underlying issues there. Just real quickly, bottom line is seeing you know, seeing in, in our community and people trying to be, or, or for lack of a better term, people trying to find out who they are. And what we've got to teach people is who they are in Christ. That's really the bottom line. Who they are in Christ. I could care less what my melanin looks like, you know, you know my skin tone. It doesn't, none of that matter. A lot of, and you know, and unfortunately, you know, we live in a culture where we push, you know what I mean, we, and, and this may make folk uncomfortable. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm black and I'm proud. Well, I'm proud to be black too, but if I was white, I'd still be proud. I mean, <laughs> I mean I'm in Christ. That's I, I was going to hell as a black man, but it was Christ that set me free. And so that's what we got to teach people. Listen, it's about him. And, and, and you can't have a temporal perspective on what's going on, we have to have an eternal perspective of yeah. what's going on. Yeah. And our eternal perspective is this world here in its present condition is not our home. Mm -hmm. So we've got to preach a gospel Amen. to a people that will understand that and not focus so much on, on this present world, but on how we get to the next. Right. And I'll just say real quick, there's nothing wrong with being you know, proud, so to speak, of your, your culture. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Yeah. But what happens is when you put your culture over Christ, mm -hmm. that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are, you know, maybe we'll talk about it later. If you are from a Jewish culture, right, and you have accepted Christ, I don't, I don't mind if you practice a Sabbath day, but in proper context, right, as a memorial, I don't mind that. That's part of your culture. Who am I to tell you to get away from your culture? But when you start to put that stuff above Christ, you put your ethnicity above Christ, now you're in sin. And we should never do that as believers. It's okay to be wherever you're from, whether you're from America, Puerto Rico, Mexico, wherever you're from, there's nothing wrong with that. Be proud from where you came from. But you know what? It's all Christ Jesus and his gospel. Yes, That's the main thing. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. Question number seven. Um, we have many that claim uh, the title of Christian, but are also observant of the law. Uh, for example, Hebrew Israelites, Seventh-day Adventists, etc. Um, are those individuals a part of the body of Christ or are they the mission field? Okay, so Hebrew Israelites and Seventh day Adventists. So the question is we have many that claim the title Christian, right? All right, once again, we get back to the doctrine. Now, the problem that we're going to have. If they're practicing the law, there's nothing wrong with practicing it. The problem is when you try to teach others that they have to, because right. that's what the doctrine says. So then that's when it becomes damning and you have a problem. When one wants to tell you you have to adhere to this or you have to adhere to that, but you know, but you're not really adhering to the grace of God to your fellow brother, right? So let's go over to Galatians 3. I'm gonna start at verse 19 through 
uh, 22, and I'll read this. It says, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Mm -hmm. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Mm -hmm. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Right? So there we have it. The law, then faith. Right? And we understand that both of those don't walk hand in hand. If you want to go and you don't want to eat pork or swine or whatever, fine. But you can't, you know, condemn your brother for doing it. Here's another problem that we <laughs> that we all have. Galatians 5. Verses 4 through 6. All right? And it says this. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law. That word estranged means divorced. So if you are estranged from Christ, then you are divorced from the cross. Which means the blood does not work on you anymore. You have a problem. But let me continue. It says you have become estranged from Christ. You who, have, who attempt... To be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. For by the law, I'm sorry, for we through the Spirit <coughs> eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith through, I'm sorry, faith working through love, right? So there you have it. You can't have the law and Christ. You have Christ. So you can practice all you want. But don't teach your brothers that they have to do those things of the Mosaic law. Right? Yeah. Right Okay. Um, and I'll do this tomorrow a lot, so um, get ready. <laughs> Got a pop quiz. How many uh, commandments were there? Raise your hand. How many commandments are there? Go ahead. I didn't hear 10 yet. <laughs> right, there are many more than 10 commandments. There are many, right? Um, it's about 613, exactly. So um, when you look through like, the whole um, uh, uh, witnesses uh, scripture in the Old uh, Covenant here, uh, beginning at Exodus chapter 20, right? Um, and so, um, and this topic, I said this to the brothers privately, um, and I'm saying it publicly here. Um, I'm a former Seventh-day Adventist myself, right? Mm. I was born and raised in it, third generation deep, you know? Right. I was raised in it like from cradle roll type of thing, you know, and expected to be cradled to the grave, but uh, God had a different plan. Um, and so when we look at the scriptures, right, what the law was um, when Moses uh, received it from God, let's get it right, it's God's law uh, through Moses, right? So um, when we look at that, there's more than 10. And if you start in verse 20, you see all these kinds of things. Now, uh, if we keep going through 21, through Exodus 22, through Exodus 23, we're going to continue to see more and more and more laws or explanations and clarifications of these laws. And uh, I want to invite you to go to Exodus chapter 24 with me real quick. And I'm going to begin at verse uh, 6. All right, again, I'm reading from NASB. Um, 24 and 6 and following says Moses took half the blood and put it in basins and the other half of the blood and sprinkled it on the altar and he took the book of the covenant right and read it in the hearing of the people what did he take in his hand the book of the okay and he read it in the presence of the people and he said all that the Lord has spoken we will do how much of it all. okay all of the book all of that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. How many of those words? All. Okay, y'all in the book. Okay? Now when we start to look at what uh, we see in James, if uh, we offend in one point, we're guilty of? All. Oh my goodness. Okay? So the question that needs to be asked is, if we're keeping the law, right, do you need a savior? That's right. That's a question. If you're keeping the law, right, practice, eh, sure, why not, right? Keeping, that's a different story, right? 
Because if you offend in one, we're guilty of all. Now, here's the scary part. Go to uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1. All right, we all, already, we all love to run to uh, verse 9. We confess our sins, but wait. <laughs> Don't get there yet, all right? Um, if you start in verse uh, 5, right? Um, if you start in verse 5, in 5 and 6, 1 John 1, verses 5, 6, uh, uh, and 7, it talks about walking in darkness versus walking in light, mm -hmm. right? That's practicing darkness versus practicing light, right? This is walking in darkness. Am I, am I in the book? Y'all with me? Amen. Okay, I'm going to talk back to me preaching now. Come on now, right? So if we're walking in darkness, right? Now verse 6 says, if we have, if I say, if we say that we have fellowship with him, be God, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, has cleansed us from all sin. Now, um, I had a conversation with the Hebrew Israelites, particularly IUIC, shout out to y'all, in Ohio, right? Um, and, and we uh, asked them a question, right? They hate, they hate us over there. Right? Um, so we had a question um, about the law, right? And we all know that sin is the transgression of the Oh. Okay, so we're all in the book, right? That's First John, again, chapter 3. So we know that sin is the transgression of the law. How many sins do I have to commit to transgress the law? Oh, oh my goodness. So I asked them, I said, y'all say you keep the law, right? Yeah, and sin is the transgression of the law, right? Do you sin? Dead silence. Hmm. They got mad, mad, big mad. Like, they edited us out of the video. <laughs> Look, man. <laughs> Right, like that's serious. IUIC Ohio, check them out, right? Um, and <laughs> and I brought them to this in verse eight here. I'm still in First John, chapter one, verse eight. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Oh my God! So if we're saying that we're keeping the law, and we, in order for us to keep the law, we have to keep the whole thing, the whole thing. He said all the words in this book you'll keep, right? But if we confess our sins, mm -hmm. he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can't say that we keep it. I dare you guys, in this room, there's plenty of theologians in here. Can you name one person aside from Christ who kept the whole law? Raise your hand, quick. Don't be shy. <laughs> Where the stones at? We're going to stone this guy. <laughs> Not one has kept the whole law without sin. So all of us need a savior. Come on. So here's a question, right? When we say people are keeping the law, are you keeping the law as practice, as cultural uh, practice, or whatever the case is, right? Can you keep the law? And here's a question I have for anybody who says they keep the law. You do fine. Do you do it according to the scriptures as God said? Or are you doing it according to man's law? I got one more scripture for y'all. It's going to hurt your feelings. Right? Go ahead. Um, go back to uh, Leviticus 24. Verse 5. Okay? I asked my Hebrew Israelite friends this who claim that they keep the law. Right? And um, if you're Hebrew Israelite and you watch it, God bless y'all. Welcome. Right? Um, but those that say they keep the Sabbath, uh-oh. Verse 24. Then you shall take fine, uh, I'm sorry, verse, uh, chapter 24, verse 3, verse 5. Blah. Chapter 24, verse 5, book of Leviticus, final answer. Then you shall take five fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it, two tenths of an ephah, and shall be in each cake. And you shall set them in two rows, six to a row, and the pure gold table before the Lord. You shall put frankincense on each row, that it may be a memorial portion for the bread, even an offering by fire to the Lord, every Sabbath day. He shall set it. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna say it again. Every Sabbath day, he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. It is an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel, forever. Olam is the word in Hebrew. 
It shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy to him from the Lord's offering his fire, watch this, his portion, olam, forever. Can you do that today? There is no temple. And according to Hebrews chapter 7, we got a new priesthood too. So my question is, you keep the Sabbath, but how? I don't have a problem if you're going to rest. Right. Watch this. No law that God gives in the Old Testament in any way, shape, or form, no law that God gives is going to harm you. Do we all agree there? Yes. No, not one. But if we're talking about how we're keeping this thing, right, it's not according to the book. And if you can find a temple and a recipe for showbread, holla at your boy. <laughs> and real quick, um, real quick, even with the, like, we see the term forever in the scriptures in the Old Testament, right? The thing is, when someone tells you, yeah, I keep a whole law, you know, you take like the Psalm 110 or something like that. Right. You got to keep all the commandments, right, for the Lord. Cool. What about when it says forever? Yeah, of course, you're supposed to do the Sabbath day, you know, got to keep the Shabbat, got to do all that. Cool, but what about when you start doing like the feast days, like when it's supposed to be done? There you go. Forever. So the question is, like, does forever really mean forever? Or was forever until a certain event happened? That's good. With Christ Jesus. Once again, I'm like I'm like Brother Colin. I don't mind if you actually want to do the Sabbath day. You want to rest, you want to chill out. That's fine. But like what part though? Do do you actually get up and move? You know, like we see things in like Jeremiah, I believe Jeremiah 16, if I'm not mistaken, where the Lord says literally, like, don't don't do anything. But I see brothers on the street corner preaching the gospel, which is no gospel, right? right? Like, so the thing is, what is forever? What are we taking? You know, because a lot of people want to pick and choose. Yeah, man, I ain't cheating on my wife. I'm keeping the law. Yeah, that's cool. But all right, have you lied before? Well, yeah. You ain't keeping the law. You don't broke the law. You got to keep the whole entire thing. Thank God that Christ has fulfilled the law. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, so right now, I know there's a lot of it's been a lot of information given out. Um, so we're going to take a, a quick intermission. Uh, real quick, probably like five to seven minutes, something like that. Um, just kind of process the information, get up, walk around, talk to each other. Um, if you have any questions that you've written down already, um, you can bring them up here, or I'll, I'll kind of go around, or just find me and give, give me the questions. Um, or you can take this time to write some questions down. And when we come back from the intermission, uh, we have a few more questions to go through and then we'll start answering some of those questions um, from you all. Cool. Yeah, and the bathrooms are right down this hallway to the right. So I think we'll spend, we'll spend about, about 20 more minutes. Is that cool with everyone? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, about 20 more minutes, that yeah. sounds fair. It's good to get oh, yeah. fed. We, we'd be wasting time at home. Don't, don't tell them that. Come on, come on. Come on. Listen to the past. Come on, that's the past to me, man. I see it. Um, cool, so we we'll, feed me. <laughs> so we'll hop right into the questions. Um, so I'll just go ahead and read the first one. Uh, so this says, it seems that many false doctrines and cults begin with uh, extra uh, revelation uh, or new perspectives and interpretations. Um, how important is the doctrine of the authority and sufficiency of scripture in our apologetics? Um, do we do harm in encouraging our people to seek a new word or a fresh word and visions? Um, in the last part of this question, is the Holy Spirit inspired Bible enough for doctrine, salvation, growth, and guidance in our Christian life? Um, I'll just touch on that uh, briefly. Um, like tomorrow, we're dealing with the conscious community. Um, and if you guys are free tomorrow, please come out. We got some great lectures. Come, come you guys this way. For example, um, Wallace Farah Muhammad. Anyone familiar with Wallace Farah Muhammad? Yes, sir. He was the founder of the Nation of Islam, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when he comes to, and I'm going to do it all again tomorrow. When he came to Detroit, he began to sell silks, okay? He went door to door, selling silks to people. He came in and he would tell people, like, hey, we should go and uh, get, do a Bible study, right? Like, oh, yeah, cool, cool, because people from the, who migrated from the south and coming to the north, that's all they were familiar with. They weren't familiar with the Quran or anything like that, but only the Bible. 
So what begins to happen is he's saying like, hey, I got this real revelation, this new revelation about the Bible, but then he twists it around and begins to attack the Bible and Christianity as well. Okay, The dangers of when a person says, hey, I got a new revelation, I'm always careful when someone says, I got a revelation. Oh, what, you, what, you, what, you, what you talking about? You mean a revelation? You mean you just you studied in the Lord? Oh, cool, but you start saying stuff like, yeah, man, the Lord, he showed me that. You know, when we go through the 12 gates, the 12 gates really mean the 12 admin. I don't know, I'm just making this up right now. <laughs> Correct. That's you got it. That's, 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 that's how it goes. That's how it goes. That's that easy. <laughs> that's, but that's how people do it, right? right. That's how people get real pseudo. They start just rambling and stuff. And people are like, man, that makes a lot of sense, man. That when, when Moses crossed the Red Sea and the, the Lord split the Red Sea, that was really doing with the... What are we talking about, right? You <laughs> have to be careful. When people start saying, I got a new revelation, the Lord showed me this, what you mean? I'm real careful. Work. Let's even be real. Now, I believe in the spirit realm and all that type of stuff. I believe in the gifts. I hopefully know them. So. <laughs> <Don't say laughs> <me. Christ. laughs> right. But this is my thing. When even when someone says, the Lord told me, I got a prophetic word for the house. I'm out. Careful. What you mean you got a prophetic word for the house? Mm -hmm. Don't tell me no prophetic word don't line up with the word. Mm -hmm. And that prophetic word you give, you got to make sure it come to pass. Mm -hmm. Because if it was under the Old Testament, Old Covenant, if it don't come to pass, what's going to happen to them? So Stone it. <laughs> because you know why God was worthy of a penalty? Because if you're going to tell somebody that the Lord says something, guess what? Right. They're going to follow that. Right. But you lying on the Lord, you talk about what the Lord told me this and they come to pass, man, that's worthy of death. Come on, man. Let's just be real. Mm -hmm. That's why, that's why uh, especially uh, Elder Howway said, give me what your Bible. Mm -hmm. Anybody can tell you some spiritual stuff. Yeah, that, that's cool. What the Bible say. Mm -hmm. I believe in the spirit realm. I believe in demons and stuff like that, but Hey, some people talking to, to some demons thinking it's Jesus, and then hey, let's just be real. Come on now. So, that's, yeah. good. That's, good. that's good. Um, I think that when we allow anybody to take away our, our sword, then we become powerless. I think we start arguing from our own intellect and thinking that we can win the debate and argument, and then all of a sudden you leave the scriptures out of it. Well, the power is in the word. Yeah. And so, it, it's to answer the question, it's absolutely critical that we, we don't allow our enemy to take our weapon. Yeah. Right? They're, they're coming at us with all different types of ideologies and thought processes and uh, things that we may or may not be familiar with. And then, you know, if we stick with the scriptures, then they, they're forced to reckon with the scriptures. And then that, just like Satan, you know, the, the first time he tempted Jesus, he just tempted him with... You know, some ideology. Mm -hmm. Jesus came back with scripture. Mm -hmm. And so now Satan's like, oh, okay, I gotta use scripture. Mm -hmm. But he used it wrongly. Right, yeah. So now we gotta know how to handle it the right way. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then go back at them. So absolutely to answer the question, Jesus was our example. Uh the word is how we deal with false doctrine and everything else. And another thing I want to add too about uh, you know, when people come at you, it's so many false doctrines, so many teachings, and this new false heresy being made up every day. Like, a, a lot of times, apologists feel like they have to have an answer right away, or they have to be able to respond, or else they lost. Like, it's okay to be like, I don't know, I'll get back with you. Especially when you, if somebody, you know, amongst your flock asks you a question, be sure that you let them know you you'll get them an answer, and then you get back with them. You know? yeah, yeah. But it's okay to not have an, an immediate answer all the time. That's right. I think that's, that's the, right. the trap. That's and then we start saying a bunch of stuff that kind of don't make sense or is wrong. That's so we want to avoid that. Amen. That's a good word. That's good. Uh, real quick, if I may. Um, <clears throat> We we have instructions in the book too, right? Um, Isaiah eight twenty says to the law to the testimony. They speak, they speak not according to the word, it's because there's no light in them, right? And so when we get the word uh, canon, right? You ever heard of the word canon before, right? These sixty six books that uh, that we have here are canon. The canon comes from the uh, Greek word which means a rule or read, and that's how you measure. And so what uh, Brother Desmond was just saying was absolutely correct. We have a measuring stick. So someone said the parking lot prophets, okay, I'm talking to y'all, right? So the parking lot prophets coming, I got a word from the Lord. 
right? Um, you know, and they got all this stuff, right? And they're gonna tell you this and tell you that and whatever, and they don't want me to preach in there because they, you know, I'm all right, right? They, you know, they want you to preach in there because you're talking some mess, right? And that's the thing. It's like, and, and these things are not according to the law and to the testimony, right? There's no light in them. Right? Like Deut Deuteronomy 18, yes, we're supposed to stone them, right? But it also says, do not fear them. Mm. God's not talking to them. Right. You don't have to, God, you're going to be cursed if you leave this church. I bet I don't. <laughs> I passed Krispy Kreme with here coming from the hotel. The hot light was on. Relax. <laughs> Relax. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I'm not a, I'm not afraid of people that say things like that. You have to be careful. Like you said, and but again, if you're not familiar with the book, you'll fall for anything. That's right. You believe anything anybody says because it's how deep. Come on. And, um, this is me this me being petty. Um, I, I just really have a pet peeve. <laughs> if a dude come up to me and I got a prophetic word. Right, what's a prophetic word, brother? We'll let him to hear. The Lord's doing a new thing. All right, you know what? <laughs> we need to start calling these false prophets out. Amen. I mean, on the real, like, you know how they say, you know, the first 10 people that sold $50, God said, we need to, when, when after them seven days go back, <laughs> you didn't get it. We need to call them up, but people, we don't do that. And so what happens, they go to the next town and rob them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, yeah. And then before long, we forget they robbed us and bring them in. <laughs> <laughs> we got to call them out. When we call them out, we put a stop to this. Bruh. Yes, sir. I'm Bruh. so sorry. Come on, man. I'm so sorry. My bad, my bad. Preach, preach. We got to, this is another thing. Can false prophets tell the truth? Yes. 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 See? False prophets mm. can tell the truth. So a lot of people are like, oh, it came to pass, though. So what? what's their fruit looking like? Oh, Babel, everything Babel was saying, it came to pass. Mm. But what happened? What was he leading the people of Israel to do? Mm. Sexual morality and uh, sacrificing the false gods. Right. People, just because someone has a word and it comes to pass, that does not mean they're a prophet. That's right. right. Examine the fruit. We, yeah, yeah. We, that, and that's what just my prophecy. That's what teaching, that's yeah, what whatever. It's 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 just because someone can teach, that doesn't mean that they're ready. Just because they can prophesy and come to pass, that doesn't mean that they're a prophet. We have to be careful. We have to examine fruit. And sometimes the way that we best see fruit is if we just wait and see. Be patient. I promise I'm done. Watch yeah, it. That's right. a good word. That's good word. That's good word. That's good word. All right. Let's uh, keep it moving along. So I don't want to, speaking of keeping your word, I want to try to keep my word. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, this, ne this next question. Um, so, so there's a, a feedback in this, right? So when we were talking about apologetics, um, no one mentioned the importance of being respectful during an apologetic mm -hmm. engagement. Um, so if you all, or maybe like a couple of you could just speak on how important it is to listen um, in apologetics or engaging in apologetics. <laughs> it is actually essential that we listen and that we don't forget that we're the Christian in the conversation. Because folk could take you there before you know it. You like, that's why you going in. No, no, that's not how we are supposed to respond. That's right. We are and people are often looking at the that more so than what we said, yeah, yeah. you know. So that character uh, means so much. And um, let's just go to the text, First Peter three fifteen. Yeah. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you yeah. with yeah. meekness and fear. Remember. When people disagree, sometimes we can allow that to offend us. Like you trying to say I'm wrong? That's pride. Remember, if, if that person doesn't know Christ, their soul is in jeopardy. And so that's that has to be our focus. And we can't lose sight of that in the midst of uh, a discussion with someone who may be rebutting what you're saying. You you know, with the help of the Lord, we have Christ. And we're trying to uh, impart Christ into them. Um, real quick, believe it or not, I've heard more people come to Christ Still in the realm of apologetics, just of someone saying, I was just observing the fruit. You're patient with me. Yeah. You show love to me. Mm -hmm. 
Like, right. once again, I'm not saying love is um, this thing where we just conform into what they believe, right. but love is also like, hey, you know what? You are not a believer, right? But I'm going to stand firm on the word, but I'm going to still love you and be patient. Yeah, you can call me all these type of names. This was one uh, Israelite group, and he said, brother, you know, you're going you gonna to get the wrath of the most high if you don't repent. Like <laughs> you're going to die. And I'm like, it's all good. I said, I love you regardless. And that's not being soft. Mm -hmm. I love you regardless because I do want your soul to be saved. Mm -hmm. right? exactly. I don't want you to be saved. Exactly. So we still have to show respect. Stand firm. Right. Right. We still have to show love, though. Right. I'm going to continue reading um, 1 Peter 3, 15, um, and 16 and 17. Right? It says, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, blessed are those who are reviled for my name's sake, right? which are slandered, for those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God will it so that you suffer for doing what is right than for what's doing wrong. Right? And it's better to be persecuted for doing right than to be punished for doing wrong, right? So, um, and sometimes it looks the same. You can go to uh, China um, and preach the gospel and end up in prison, or you can ride the liquor store around the corner, the wake shop right over here, right? And go to prison. Be, if you're going to be punished, be punished for doing the right thing, persecuted for the name of Christ. Great is your reward to him. Mm -hmm. Well, dealing with this whole being, you know, kind thing, I would have to say, you know, watching uh, Elder Mike and, you know, others yes. do yep. things like that, it definitely <laughs> helped me to calm down, because I was a pit bull in <laughs> the field. Now, I didn't call nobody out their name or nothing, but they definitely knew that I was not playing with them. But, yeah, it's definitely, you know, a positive thing to, you know what I'm saying, just show them love and be more kind. So, you know, and it's always good to have good brothers, for example. They know, they've seen the videos, they know how I was, but I'm different now. <laughs> Trying to get like you, because I still be telling dudes to square up. <laughs> 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 uh, that's funny, but, uh, kind of serious, pretty funny. Um, so, next question. It says, uh, This is off topic, uh, but since we went to John, I use John 5 24 to support um, someone who is truly born again would not lose salvation. Does anyone see any problems with using this verse? Providing you subscribe to it. John 5 what? Uh, 524. Let me read the verse. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life uh, I do think it's an appropriate verse to use in that context because everlasting life is what it's just that everlasting life now uh, and we were talking about the essentials earlier this would be a non-essential right because Christians have been debating this topic from uh, the early church fathers to present whether or not a person can lose your salvation uh, this text would certainly tell us that we have everlasting life, but uh, my pastor says this, and I borrow it from him. If you think you can lose your salvation, don't. And if you don't think you can lose it, you won't. So leave it at that. That's good. I like that. <laughs> um, one of the things that we have to be careful of, too, like um, I've, I've seen a lot of things, um, and... Um, Went to a, a Christian college, right? Um, Huntsville, Alabama, Oakwood University, ooh, right? Um, and it's a Christian school, and every semester they have a week of prayer, right? And every semester you'll see the usual suspects up on an altar weeping and crying and snotting and everything else, right? Um, and how, how you're taught in some circles is that you can lose salvation. So when you sin, God's ready to just be like, got you. You're done. It's over. Right? And when we start to feel that way about, about God who says, I love you, I love you, come home, right? He knew that we were sinful. He said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
And a lot of us um, have uh, outsourced our salvation based on what we do. Yes, true. Yeah. It's my works. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right? And what Jesus, uh, I believe, says here is um, who believes, who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death to life. If we trust that and we start to bear fruit, once we're actually saved, not just you said a prayer and then you went back out and went back to the liquor store and to your girlfriend's house. And you keep doing that over and over and over and over again. Again, we talked about earlier in First John about walking in darkness versus right. walking in light. It says he's that begun a good work in you will perform it mm -hmm. until the day of Jesus Christ. So we there's not one person in here that can say that they're sinless. Can we? Nope. Don't be shy. Not one of us that here that can say that um, that we're uh, uh, we're uh, flawless and that we bat a thousand when it comes to sal uh, salvation and things of more failures and things of that nature. But we do not walk after the spirit. There's no condemnation that I'm not walking the uh, spirit and not after the flesh. And we have to stand on that word. Now, the, uh, typically, what happens is people say, "Oh, well, y'all are lawless. You know, y'all got this cheap grace that you can do whatever you want." I dare you to find that in the New Testament anywhere. Find, find it for me. I'll ride with it, but you can't. Matter of fact, in Matthew 5, when Jesus is reiterating the laws that came down from Moses, you've heard it said this, but I say this. If you look at them, they're way more stringent. Yeah, yes. Way more stringent. And that shows you the ineptitude that we have of ourselves to do right without Christ. And without the involvement of the Holy Spirit, that's why we we're called to be. And I'm and I'm I'm not here for the um the the the, the weepy altar calls all the time because some people can cry and on a dime. Some people are sad and weep because they got caught. They feel guilty, but if we confess, I acknowledge my sin. I messed up, right? Then we can start to uh, grow and things like that. And that's where discipleship comes in, I think. Yeah. You know, if we're discipling one another and how we walk in, uh, 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 in, 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 um, in salvation and so forth, you know, I think that helps us, you know, um, and it's true conversion of the heart. And we start to, the things of this world start to fall away. And we start to become more and more like Christ as we walk with him. Right? It's not a one and done type of situation. We got to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. right? It's not way left, way right. Following Christ. Yeah. I like real quick. Um, I like one of the ways that Paul uses grace in Ephesians. You look at the Greek word for it for grace. It's actually God's divine influence upon the heart, and that's why when a lot of people say, "What do you mean you're under grace and not the law, or are you just under grace?" No, biblical grace does not give you the license to sin. Right. If it's God's divine influence on the heart, then it's what to walk in holiness, right? Yeah. So, no, it does not give us a license to sin, but if we sin, what is it saying for John? We have an advocate with the Father. Oh, so. yeah. Right? What's it talking for our sin? So. Yeah. Mm. All right. Um, so, right now we have about three more questions. Um, so, I say let's go f about five minutes per question. Let's just rock this boy out to 9 30. What do y'all think? <laughs> <laughs> No? Oh, wow. Everyone's just looking at me like, I don't know. You said 20 minutes, like 18 minutes ago. But, um, is that cool with y'all? Yeah. 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 Feed us. Yeah. 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 Lock the door. So let's get right to it. Um, so this question, um, it says, many in the conscious community believe that Jesus is nothing more than a copycat myth from ancient Egyptian gods. Is there any evidence that points to Jesus being a recycled story of Horus, Osiris, and etc.? No. <laughs> so, just real quick, um, when people say that, that this shows a lack of um, you know, study, honestly, all you have to do is, for one, look at the, the similarities or, that are alleged, and they're superficial. I mean, they, Mithras, for example, he was born of a rock. 
It's not a virgin birth. So, so these are some of the similarities that they say are uh, similar. Or uh, Osiris uh, was resurrected. No, he was cut up and then sewn back together. That's not dying and then coming back to life. That's not being resurrected. So, so those are some of the things that we look at. And then, okay, let's, let's kind of act like they are copying. I, I got a story about a book. It's called Futility. I don't know if you heard of it. Futility. It was uh, about uh, the largest ship of its time called the Titan. Right? This came out 14 years before the actual Titan. The Titan was running in the uh, northern Atlantic. I believe it was going from, don't quote me on this one, but it was going from <laughs> London to New York. And uh, it sank after it hit an iceberg. 14 years before the Titanic, the largest ship of this time, those names are very similar, and it was going from New York to London, um, and it hit the iceberg and it sank. A lot of similarities there. Does that falsify what happened to the Titanic because it was similar to what happened in, um, futility. in futility? No. 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 But, but the point is this, even, even though it's similar, one is actually a myth and the other one is true then you, you, you look at the fact that um, even in the copycat theory, you have uh, most of the copycat uh, assumptions, they come a hundred years after Christ had already risen from the dead. Like they, A lot of them, they start backtracking like um, Osiris had 12 apostles. No, he had four. Right. But they changed it and said he had 12 later on. Um, and then going back to the book, right? So just because a book or just because uh, something sounds similar, one is fact, one is actually fiction or myth, right? So I, I hear what people say, like, well, they dressed it up. They dressed Christianity up to make it fulfill those things and make it look like it. The only problem is you can't fake somebody rising from the dead. And that's where our hope is. It's in the resurrection. Yes. Oh, yeah. so, so whenever we deal with a copycat theory, just go straight to the resurrection. Did Jesus rise from the dead or not? Let's deal with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Let's move on. Thanks. Amen. Um, this is a really good book by uh, J.P. Hoeing. It's called Shattering the Christ Myth. Really, really good book. Um, I mean, my thing is also, look, you, you telling me that Horus, which if you ever read how Horus is born, y'all ever read that before? How they take the hand your legs. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it, it doesn't sound right. But okay, let's let's deal with some of the sources then. What do you know about Osiris, Horus, Isis, and things? Let's deal with the um, let's deal with the um, Book of the Dead, right? Which ain't nothing but a book of spells. We don't even put them on the same level as the Gospels. So it doesn't have even have the same literature. Um, let's look at the coffin text, the pyramid text, like. Where are you getting this from? Because when we look on those walls of Egypt, we don't get that true. whatsoever. We look at the primary sources of Kemet, as they will say. We don't see it. So where are you getting this from? I'm actually show you guys tomorrow where they get it from. It's the same people they claim that they hate, but that's a whole other thing. It's a cliffhanger for tomorrow. That's why you should come tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Um, there is a book that's been out. Um, for a while, it's, uh, it was actually published in 19, uh, early 1900s. It's called The World's 16 Crucified Saviors, <laughs> or Christianity Before Christ. Ooh, right? You got us now, right? Um, the <laughs> thing of it is, right, um, a lot of the things that we heard today um, come from that book, right? And th there, uh, it was written by a man named Kersey Graves. Kersey Graves was... Um, uh, a, uh, oh, you're going to cover that tomorrow? Okay, never mind. I'll just come tomorrow. You'll hear what Christian is <laughs> <laughs> um, And then so, like, uh, the, the, if you look online, you can find the PDF versions of it. Um, and I was looking at, I was in some uh, chat room war with some atheist, and he brought this up. And if you find this, the sixth edition, right, the sixth edition, uh, the PDF, there is an editor's note. I'm going to read it for you verbatim. i got it right here in front of me. It says, note, the scholarship of Kersey Graves has been questioned by numerous free thinkers. That's the atheists. The inclusion of the world's 16 crucified saviors in the secular web's historical library does not 
constitute endorsement by Internet Infidels Incorporated. That's a large uh, atheist web, web group. Now here's this. This document was included for historical purposes. And I'm not making this up. Readers should be extremely cautious in trusting anything in this book. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Y'all can't, if the atheists are saying, don't trust this mess, what are you doing trusting this foolishness? <laughs> like, the, it's right here. You know what I'm saying? So that's one of those things, if you look it up, and you, I'm not making this up, look up the sixth edition of World's Crucified Savior, and you'll see this on, the, on their PDF that they're putting out there. And so a lot of stuff, and uh, I think uh, Elder Holloway said it best, we're the Christians. So it's up to us, we have to do all the heavy lifting in being honest in our scholarship. We have to do all the heavy lifting, lifting being honest in what we're finding, honest with what the text says, honest with all that stuff. They can lie and say whatever they want. We got to be honest about this. And so when you have stuff like this, it's easy to be honest, ain't it? Right? Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Uh, next question. Is the Holy Spirit a force or the law that is spoken of in the Old Testament? <laughs> Hebrew Israelites. <laughs> Can you see the man just pass me? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, is the Holy Spirit a force or the law that is spoken of in the Old Testament? Of course, we know that the Holy Spirit is God, right? Yes. Yes. Right? yes. So he's not uh, a force as the Jehovah Witnesses would say right. because he's not a tornado or a tidal wave. He is one who speaks and teaches, mm -hmm. right? If we go over to John, uh, I think it's chapter 14. He lets you know that he will teach you, right? And rebuke you and repute you yes. and all of these good things, right? Mm -hmm. Now, on the latter half of that question, uh, <laughs> is the law spoken, I'm sorry, a force or the law that is spoken of in the Old Testament, right? Well, depending on who you ask, if you ask the Hebrew Israelites, of course they will say that the, uh, the Holy Spirit is the law, right? And where do they get that from? So, first scripture that they will use was Psalms 51 and 11, right? Let's go there. And this is what it reads. It says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me, right? So, the, the black Hebrew is like, take scriptures as we know and they twist the scriptures and make what they call precept packs so they take a bunch of scriptures and read them out of context and they make their own you know what I'm saying doctrine so when we look at this we see it in Psalms 51 11 where it's supposed to be dealing with uh, spiritual understanding of scripture but then they like to go over to Acts chapter 7 right so let's travel there now if you can't follow along don't be mad because that's how they teach it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a so we had Acts chapter seven, fifty one through fifty three. Is you know, it's, it's one thing to understand a person's uh, premise, and the premise isn't biblical. So then, there you go, trying to unfold what they have put together. So fifty one through fifty three. You want me to read, buddy? Ready? Read. 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 That's right. That's right. <laughs> 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 so, just, just in short, it says this. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of, of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. Right? So when you take this scripture and then you go back to John and you, and you add another scripture to that, then you have to start to add, you know, say your own interpretation in. But this is something we're going to deal with tomorrow. I'm, he's on a time limit. And we will deal with... Uh, Contextual criticism in another word called conflating, where you take two ideas yes, sir. and you put them together and you make your own idea. Very good, right? Yes, sir. Read. Read. 
That's why. Dude, even if you do something simple, right? Oh, this is why I tell people, man, it's okay to read the Hebrew and the Greek. Like, it's okay to do that. Um, you just look at the in, the, in the in the Old Testament, you take the Hebraic word for law, it's Torah, right? Or even if you take the the Hebraic word for commandments, it's mitzvah. Okay, and you compare that to what is, what is a what is a Hebraic word for spirit, right? Yeah. Exactly. You compare those two, it's like it ain't it ain't the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alex actually, and I'm gonna steal your point. Um, he made a really good point. That's so, why you know we gonna have Alex next year on this panel. Yeah. 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 He he made a good point. If you're telling me that the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the Lord is the law, right? right the law of Moses. Well, if we go back to Genesis one, what was hovering oh, over? Tablets. Was it be so? So if we're going to take that off, right, right. So if we're going to use that, right, that means it was tablets hovering over the face. What? Does it make more sense? Mm. That's all. That's it. That's it. So I'm learning in apologetics, patience, and asking questions is key. Because it's like, man, you give me all these scriptures. That's cool. Do you even know what that means? You calling me? You call me, oh yeah, you know, the law of Moses was really in the garden. How? Mm -hmm. Show me. Right. Explain to me uh, Galatians 3 and 17 when Paul said, uh, for the law came 430 years after. Come on, man. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Like, like, like we got to deal with this stuff. So That's man. right. Yeah, man. Yeah. All right. Here we are. Last question. <laughs> so... In three minutes, <laughs> what is the New Age movement, and what are the dangers of this? <laughs> That's a three-minute question. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna be short. Here we go. All right. So when we're dealing with the New Age movement, we have to uh, really go back to where these uh, teachings came from. Basically, through Hinduism, right? Mm -hmm. So. The New Age movement is basically the enthronement of man and the deification of God. Mm -hmm. Where they start to tell you all the things that you can do versus all the things that God can do. Mm -hmm. right? And we see so many different uh, teachers that came through and started um, teaching, we want to say, uh, can't think of the word, wait, I'm going to have to go right now. Okay, here's a word for you, theosophy. Yeah, exactly. A knowledge of God that may be established through what? Spiritual ecstasy, right? Mm -hmm. So then once again we go all the way back to Genesis 3 or what or what, Genesis where you shall be what? Like God. Right? So that's just a quick fix on it, but of course we can always get into it a little deeper. Right? Mm -hmm. that's good. That's good. Um the New Age movement is uh, movement is very dangerous because you're dealing with so many different things. The idea that you can um, open up your third eye. I've heard prophets mm. say that stuff. Yes. Right. Okay, oh, yes. yeah, you know, the Lord's doing my third eye, brother. You went to the mm -hmm. cult. That's what you went to. Um, you know, <laughs> let's be real. You know, the, and this is the thing I want to tell us and encourage us because I think all of us here just looking at this room, man, we have some Bible thumpers in here, and I praise God for you guys for it, like, for real. But we can get in a dangerous place where we ignore stuff like the New Age movement. Mm -hmm. We were like, man, that's just conspiracy, or that's just some other stuff, man. That ain't no nah, people who tap into this stuff. So you would take someone like um, uh, Helena Blavatsky, right? Uh, that's where that's the name we'll probably talk about tomorrow. Alice Bailey, others, and dealing with Theosophy, right? Also uh, another term, uh, esoteric doctrine. Okay, where someone who was into esoteric doctrine and the New Age movement, they could read a scripture. And uh, we'll take a scripture where Jesus says, I'm the son of God. Mm -hmm. Someone who's into the New Age movement and they practice the esoteric mindset. No, he's talking about the son. He's the son of God. Mm -hmm. Psalm, uh, Psalm 84 and 11. For the Lord is a son in the shield. Mm -hmm. If you're into esoteric mindset and the New Age, you would say, no, no, no. The Lord, the son, mm -hmm. the son, That's the Lord is really the son, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful with that. And that's why and we're going to deal with it tomorrow. That's why we should come out tomorrow. With the conscious community, a lot of people deal with this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just not, and I'll be honest, it's just not, you know, uh, minorities. It's just not black people who are dealing with this stuff. Yeah. We see this in all 
groups of people. Mm -hmm. and that's what we all need to be careful where we don't just brush the society and say, hey, that's just spiritual mumbo jumbo. Like, no, people believe in this stuff. Right? And we need to have an answer for this stuff. We need to pray that these people come out of this stuff because this stuff is real. If they was dealing with it in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, why ain't they going to be dealing with it now? Right. Let's be real about that. Just let me add real quick, and that's why we have to be careful about some of this new quote unquote Christian doctrine about creating your own reality mm. and about you being the gods. You know what I mean? Like you, you can call those things that be not. No, you can't. You can call what he said. Right? No, we don't have creative power. Only God has creative power. Amen. So a lot of that has crept over into the church. You know, some of these new age thoughts are, are common phrases right. in yeah. the Christian circles. And, and that's why we have to teach the, the biblical truth so we can wean people off of this right. bad doctrine because we become so emotion driven. You know, we go through a test. We, we don't know how to handle it because we don't have any foundational scripture to help us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. Just about one last thing. One last thing on that. Um, we talk about uh, uh, Christ being king, right? Um, how many kings sit on the throne at one time? Okay. So if everybody in the house is decreeing and declaring, <laughs> you are all committing high treason. Stop it. Stop it. Alright? We we don't have it like that. There's one king. He says, if anything you ask in my name, ask him. That might not be the thing for you. That might not be the husband for you. That might not be the wife for you. The job for you. The car for you. Everybody want a house on the hill by themselves. So you can preach the gospel to who? Your cats? Stop the foolishness. Alright? We have we have to we have to recognize and it's running rampant in our churches. And that will pack a house out. Every time right? Yeah. Prophet coming to town and Joshua Holmes got did I say his name. He's got the jacket, the Benny Hinn jacket 2.0, man. Got sequins on it. Boy, look like uh whatever, I am going right now. <laughs> you know, uh Jermaine Jackson or something. But <laughs> We have to stop the foolishness and, and teach the book. Yes, sir. Get back to the book. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah, man. Uh, I would say if I could decree and declare, man, I'd be rich. <laughs> I'd be rich. I'd be rich. I'd be good to go. But must not have faith. Exactly. So no, you can't. You can't decree and declare it. You can't bind the devil either. But that's not. Shot. Let's give it up for these guys. Yeah, this is uh, yeah. This is amazing, and and this is so. There was so much information given, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, I don't know about y'all, but I learned a lot. Like, I was writing all up on this paper the whole time. But, um, and this was just like, surf, just scratching the surface on these topics, right? Like, we literally spent, like, what, seven, eight minutes or so on each question? And that, huh? 15. Oh, was it 15? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I do encourage you all, you know, if you are free tomorrow morning, you know, to come on, you know, come on over at 10.30. Um, you know, in here, some of these fellows really just dive deep Amen. into these topics um, because they are crucial, and we see how they affect um, how they affect us. They affect our churches. Um, so yeah, so I'm not gonna hold you any longer. Um, so if we can all just stand together. I want um, to say one something. One thing with this. Uh, the address of the church is was it four zero. 4024 4, 4, West Jefferson mm -hmm. uh, Avenue, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 4024 West Jefferson Avenue, Ecourse, Michigan, Christian, Christian Bethel Church. So if you want to come out, uh, feel free. And I will encourage everyone, if you can come out tomorrow, please do. Um, and I know Alex about to pray us out, but really, honestly, this is a blessing. Like last year, we had a pretty cool turnout, but this year to see, like, and I'm just being honest, like to see. Bible numbers of heavyweights, as we like to say, in the city of Detroit, everyone coming out. No, this is like
because I don't care if you live in the inner city or you live in the suburbs. I don't care where you live. I don't care what you look like. First of all, the gospel is for everybody. Amen. Everybody. Okay. And we're all dealing with certain different things in certain areas. But guess what? We have to do this as a team. We can't just do it. That's right. One. That's right. And I got to give up to Pastor Rob as well. again thank these gentlemen um, you know they're coming out with their own time to do this right and coming from what was Ohio we don't even like the Buckeyes but we we give time to everything don't we if you're gonna watch a movie it'd be two hours plus right and you're gonna sit through the previews and all that mm -hmm. Enjoy yes. this. This is time to get fed, right? Yes. Yes, sir. And uh, I want to just thank you all for coming out. It means a lot um, to the community for them to even see people coming to church. We're, we've got a liquor store and a biker bar across the street. So anytime we can bring the gospel here and when you're getting fed, it's, it's not for you just to keep it, right? It's to pass it along. Right. Yeah. So again, keep that in mind. There's a tremendous amount of power here. Uh, because it's the gospel and it's yes. all about Jesus yeah. and I honor these gentlemen, but this is all about Jesus yeah. I encourage the ladies in church as well, right? This battle is all of ours. It's all of ours So I encourage the ladies really soak this up and next year I would love to see some ladies on the panel as well. Praise God. So Alex if you do us the pleasure of praying us out. Amen Praise God. Thank you Thank you for hosting. All right. Uh, so if everyone can uh, just kind of pray with me. Uh, and we just pray together. Um, Lord, we come before you tonight, God. I thank you uh, for this time to just come together and to just soak up your word, God, to, to begin to dive deeper into your word, Father God, so that we can really... Um, spread your gospel and really defend the faith in a way that is powerful in a way that you call us to do god yes um and i just pray right now that this be something that just encourages us to dive deeper father god to study more to seek you more um and i pray that you continue to just um just make your word clear to us father god um and lord i pray that you're with us as we leave tonight god that you just protect us on our way home, Father God, that you take us there safely, you continue to guide us in all that we do, um, and be with everyone uh, on their way back here tomorrow morning, God. Um, I just pray that you continue to have your hand on us, and you continue to provide and protect us, Lord. We love you, and we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.